Good afternoon. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, give a talk on something that's a little bit a little bit of a different flavor for me. I'm used to more giving science talks, so this is more of a a sort of reproducible paradigm based talk. Um, so so I'm excited to um, to share with you guys some of my work. So the title of my talk is is a bit of a mouthful: paradigm based spatial navigation research as a model to enhance reproducibility in cognitive neuroscience. But just to start off, I thought I'd give you all a flavor of the kind of research question that we're really going after here. One in, uh, in cognitive neuroscience is how people can vary so widely in spatial navigation behavior. On the one hand, you might consider that humans are navigational marvels. So picture this, you're stuck on a lifeboat in the middle of the Antarctic, your ship has sunk and your only chance for rescue is an 800 nautical mile journey to uh, uh, to another island, and your only tool is a sextant. You can't stand on stable land because, well, the seas look like this, and you the, you can't even use the sun because it's periodically clouded over for all but one or two times of the day. Oh, also, it's 1924, so the GPS hasn't been invented for about 60 years or so. So this is the uh, scenario faced by the voyagers on the James Caird in the Antarctic on their little lifeboat. But luckily for them, they had Frank Worsley, navigator extraordinaire. Frank Worsley, using the meager tools and senses at his disposal, was able to chart a course so accurate for that 800 nautical mile journey, as you can see traced out here in black, that he deviated less than 50 nautical miles from what is the actual shortest distance course. So humans are navigational marvels. On the other hand, spatial navigation can really easily go awry. Consider patient FG, who is neuropsychologically normal and has no lesions or brain damage whatsoever, and yet suffers from a condition that neuroscientists have called developmental topographical disorientation. This patient is profoundly disoriented in even familiar spaces, to the extent where even a restoration of a fountain in his neighborhood would suffice to make the, the route completely unrecognizable. And if he learned, if he moved to a new apartment, it would take him several months to just learn the layout of the rooms. So what's interesting about these examples to me is that spatial navigation can actually go awry in lots of different ways. Spatial navigation relies on all sorts of environmental and self-motion cues. It relies on a number of computational mechanisms, both spatial computations and executive processes. And it relies on a whole host of different kinds of representations, mnemonic-based, perception-based, etc. In other words, spatial navigation contains multitudes. And while I don't have time to go into it today, it's equally puzzling how many brain areas are involved in each of these processes. So while on the one hand, it's not so surprising that humans could be marvels and humans could be navigational, I don't know, uh, uh, completely impaired, this presents a challenge for human cognitive neuroscience because we don't just want to know how complex cognitive traits like spatial navigation work. We want to know what kinds of processes and representations they're constructed from and how this leads Oops. and how this leads to people varying so widely. So what I'll present in the rest of my time today is what we think of as a partial solution to this problem um, for cognitive neuroscience, which is to pursue reproducible paradigm-based research. So to go back to this question, most of us are somewhere in the middle for spatial navigation. The question is why? And if we want to answer that question, there's a few kinds of data that we can't really rely on that make this challenge even greater for cognitive neuroscience. So first, we can't really rely on self-report data for a number of psychological reasons that I mostly don't have time to get into. But it turns out when you ask people how good they are at stuff, they're not so good at telling you. We also can't really use real world navigation, even though it's the most ecologically valid way of testing our question. If I run a study in Florida, I can't exactly use the same environment in Australia or China or Canada or even Miami. So this presents a really difficult challenge for reproducibility. Virtual navigation, on the other hand, is both can be too difficult, by which I mean it requires very specific expertise to program the kinds of experiments that you might want to run, and it's too varied. 
Virtual navigation experiments tend to be what I call bespoke, which means they control a lot of different aspects of a task toward a particular question. Now, this is a great way to design a highly controlled lab-based study, but it's not such a great way to elicit variability in navigation behavior if that's your goal, which for me, it is. So if this is the main question we're after, spoiler alert, I'm not exactly going to be answering this question today. What I'm going to do is more present our approach using one tool that I've been using over the years called Virtual Silkton, which is an online objective measure of spatial navigation behavior that we think is a nice compromise in this space. Next, I'll describe a few examples of some key findings just to give you a sense of the kind of data that we get from this approach and how we've begun to extend it to start to answer the question up at the top. And finally, at the end, I'll do what is probably a poor job of illustrating how this paradigm-based research can help shift cognitive neuroscience norms in terms of its practice. As we start to see big data collection, I think that this kind of tool will really have a, a, a home in cognitive neuroscience. So first, introducing Virtual uh, Silkton. So Virtual Silkton was actually a virtual environment created based on the Temple University's Ambler campus. And what Victor Skenazi and his colleagues did in this real world study using, you know, real humans actually walking is taught them a number of buildings and measured basically how well they learned this environment. Now, of course, as I mentioned the problems with real world navigation, um, what we did was convert this real world uh, campus into a virtual environment model, which we renamed Virtual Silkton so that our Temple University participants wouldn't get confused, um, the Spatial Intelligence and Learning Center Test of Navigation. So what this would allow us to do is to do the same paradigm that we had done in the real world, but collect large amounts of data to see whether people vary as much as they did in the real world task. So the main paradigm that we use, which I'll call canonical virtual Silkton, goes something like this. We constrain participants learning by having them navigate particular routes highlighted here in red, along which they have to learn the names and locations of eight buildings total, four buildings per route. We then have them learn two connecting routes highlighted in yellow, which allows them to integrate the two main routes to each other, but doesn't require them to learn any new buildings. Now, here is what the virtual navigation paradigm looks like. Um, so this would be one of the main routes. And the first thing you'll see is that um, a diamond is indicated here, indicating one of the buildings that had to be learned. And participants here were bound to navigate along these particular routes. So basically all they had to do was follow the arrows. But the goal was to learn the layout of the buildings. Now, I'll also point out that while this, while all the data I'll talk about today was done on a desktop virtual reality system, we've since been building out the virtual Silicon framework to accommodate immersive virtual reality testing, both online and offline, um, as well as using more advanced tools like an omnidirectional treadmill. So after learning, participants complete two tasks designed to measure how accurately they had learned the environment. The first, an on-site pointing task. In this task, participants have to point a crosshair toward each of the buildings that they learned from each of the buildings that they learned. So in other words, a participant might be dropped here along one of the main routes. They'd have to point to all the buildings within that route, but also all of the buildings that were on the other main route that they had learned. We also had participants construct a map, which we call a model building task. In this task, participants had to drag and drop these buildings that appeared at the bottom, which we would tell them the name and show them what the building looked like and build basically a map of the virtual environment. We scored that based on how accurately the configuration matched the actual configuration of the route. So what kinds of data have we found so far with this tool? Well, the main thing we found so far, or one of the, one of the main findings from this uh, from this paradigm, is that people vary widely on two dimensions. Their within route pointing, how accurately they pointed within one route, and their between route pointing, how accurately they could point between the two routes. One group, integrators, were able to integrate the two routes together, performing well on all kinds of trials. A second group, which we called non-integrators, did just as well on within route pointing performing just as well as the integrators, but we're not able to integrate the two routes together. They perform worse on between route pointing. 
A third group, which we call imprecise navigators, performed worse compared to both and were just imprecise overall. So since that initial study, we have run uh, dozens of different studies and collected probably thousands of individual people using our online and offline versions of this task. And we've been able to replicate this finding, this basic finding of individual differences a number of different times. Now, that baseline of individual variability allows us to go in further and ask questions like how navigational training might impact variability or who gets better. For example, in one experiment, we tested subjects on virtual Silkton twice, once represented by the dot at the beginning of each arrow and once represented by the dot at the end for their performance on each kind of uh, task. And here the students had either taken a semester of GIS classes relevant to spatial learning, we would think, or communications classes. Now, what we were what we could show is that participants in the GIS uh, class not only started off better compared to their communication colleagues, but they also improved to a greater extent. In a second study, we looked at the developmental trajectory using the exact same paradigm in eight-year-olds as we did in adults and showed that the trajectories of how performance improved for within root and between root accuracy actually varied with within root pointing increasing linearly to adulthood, whereas between root or integrating sort of goes through this qualitative leap around 12 years of age. Finally, we've been able to extend this work in, uh, in terms of uh, looking at cortical volume by comparing the sort of modern day Frank Worsley's, if you will, expert navigators, London taxi drivers, who happen to have enlarged um, posterior hippocampi. So what we were able to show is that in a pre-registered study, we asked the question, are our navigators, um, are our expert navigators sort of like everyday taxi drivers? What we showed is that despite this variability that I've been talking about in the spatial navigation paradigm, we did not see any effect correlating that with cortical volume. So this actually flew in the face of the expert hypothesis using our particular paradigm of research. So what are the tools that we've been using to kind of make this an established baseline to look at variability in spatial navigation? I'll draw a few key lessons before my time runs out. First is that we try to use clear documentation, both online and off. We have open and complete instructions for online and offline administration, sort of experimental rec replicability as alluding to the past talk. We're moving on to Git versioned Unity 3D code so that each experimental protocol can be marked in terms of which uh, uh, in terms of which exact paradigm was used. Um, we're developing an open code analysis repository so the same exact reproducible workflows can be done at the data analysis stage. And finally, demonstrating these reproducible pipelines using Jupyter notebooks. And last, and one of the main reasons for building up this online repository was to create open and available data. So just to step through a few of these things, reproducible protocols in our paradigm-based research framework means allowing part experimenters to control precisely in the online framework exactly what order different um, instruments preceded and what instructions are paired with those. Our paradigm is accessible, meaning it's easily used by groups and areas that don't have domain specific expertise in virtual navigation design. So we have offline versions hosted as well as an online website that has been used by at this point over a dozen labs um, that can create their own account and par partition off their own data. What this means is that we can conduct ecologically relevant experimentation for complex cognitive traits at scale. Because this is online and offline, we can run as many participants as would be feasible. And last, because we've collected so much data already, this provides a known baseline to explore from. 
So if a challenge for human cognitive neuroscience is understanding why people vary so widely in complex traits, what I'd like to suggest is that a partial solution to this problem would be to think more about solutions that will generate reproducible paradigm-based research. So with that, I'll stop talking and take any questions. Thank you all for your attention. And of course, thank you to uh, my collaborators, my funding sources, and please feel free to get in touch with me uh, online in any form you like. Thank you so much. We do have a question for you. Um, the question was, how do you account for bias um, by using a single location for spatial navigation? Or have you tested your navigational training across different locations? Oh, this is such an important question. Yeah. So unfortunately, this is one of the downsides, right? So in a 15 minute talk, I only get to talk about the good parts. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, what, what you would really want is something to establish test retest reliability. Um, and one of the things that is that is crucial in spatial navigation, really with any kind of complex trait in general, is to establish both what your task is good at measuring and what is not so good at measuring, what its weaknesses are. Um, so, you know, we think that this is a good sort of first approach to, um, to, to collecting data showing that people vary pretty widely, but you're absolutely right to, to raise the concern that, you know, we, we would ideally want to have maybe a, a testing protocol in, in a second um, virtual environment at the minimum. Would that be part of your next steps or do you want to talk um, about your next steps? Um, yeah, I mean, so next steps really is to sort of continue to explore the, the basic findings here. There's, there's too much we don't know about the way that these representations are constructed. Um, in terms of building new virtual environments, uh, my, this is not my sole research program. You know, I, I do do some of the bespoke virtual environment design to test particular questions. Um, but one of the things that we're chasing up now with virtual Silkton is, um, seeing whether or not you give people various kinds of navigational tools. So don't just send them off on the lifeboat with nothing, but you know, give them a compass, give them a map, give them verbal instructions, see whether that helps some of our imprecise navigators improve a little bit. Well, thank you so much again. We certainly appreciate your presentation.